Armor rating, speed, stamina regen. What do these mean exactly? I've spent an inordinate amount of time attempting to translate these values into something meaningful. I have come to understand how durable the armor types are, what passives provide, how fast and how far they each can sprint, how quickly they recover stamina, and most importantly, when compared, how they stack up. There are three armor types in the game. Generally speaking, light armor is geared toward mobility at the expense of durability, heavy armor sacrifices mobility for more durability, and medium armor is more or less the middle ground. I have found them to be much less straightforward than this generalization though. Across the three types of armor, there are eight passives. Democracy Protects, Electrical Conduit, Engineering Kit, Extra Padding, Fortified, Med Kit, Scout, and Servo Assisted. Democracy Protects. 50% chance to not die when taking lethal damage. Prevents all damage from bleeding if chest hemorrhages. This armor can provide nothing or everything. I can survive a hell bomb and three grenades at my feet. The fourth one kills me. It's a dice roll. You're either lucky or you are not. The description is accurate for the most part. You are not immune to burning to death. Also, these plants, which occur on Malevolon Creek, but I've seen them elsewhere, can kill you by rubbing against them or shooting them. Shooting them gives you the same bleeding effect as an injury to your torso. As an aside, the damage over time effect can also kill bots. For all of these sources of death, I died as soon as my health reached zero, every single time. I'm either incredibly unlucky, or this passive does not trigger on damage over time effects. The Democracy Protects passive is currently only available on medium armor. Electrical Conduit provides 95% resistance to arc damage. Awesome, now I can deploy a Tesla tower and stand in it forever. Stand in it? Yes. Forever? Not even close. A Tesla tower can kill you in four to five shots. Not as cool as I was hoping, but it's a lot better than the one shot it is without this armor. Both the arc thrower and blitzer can one shot you without this passive. With it, you take just a sliver of health and damage. I am not aware of any enemies currently in the game that do arc damage. Most folks I've seen who run the arc thrower frequently tend to be very aware of appropriate angles of attack to avoid damaging their teammates. What are your thoughts on the electrical conduit passive's current usefulness? Engineering kit. Further reduces recoil when crouching or prone by 30%. Increases initial inventory and holding capacity of grenades by plus two. Without the Hellpod Space Optimization Booster, you will dive in with five of six grenades. With the Hellpod Space Optimization Booster, you will drop in, maxed out, at six. The recoil reduction works. I tested this with the AR-23 Liberator. I haven't zoomed in on a freeze frame and measured pixels to determine if it's exactly 30%. What do you think I am, some kind of nerd? It is apparent enough that it provides vertical recoil reduction. I didn't see anything that would lead me to believe this affects weapon sway. Crouching and being prone provides vertical recoil reduction regardless of this passive. Interestingly enough, this provides 30% recoil reduction while standing. Even more interesting than that is that while firing from a standing position with this passive, it's the same amount of recoil reduction you get from crouching without this passive. And you get the same vertical recoil reduction crouching with this passive as you do while prone without this passive. Extra padding provides a higher armor rating. This adds 50 armor rating to whatever type of armor it is on and more or less increases the total number of body shots you can take before dying by one for light and medium or two for heavy. We'll talk about armor rating later in the video. Fortified further reduces recoil when crouching or prone by 30% provides 50% resistance to explosive damage. The recoil portion of this, we've covered. So what does 50% resistance to explosive damage mean? For a while, I thought it behaved like democracy protects, like a roll of the dice. As there were times I'd be shot by an automaton cannon and have barely a scratch on me, other times I'd be blown to bits. I found that just inside of four meters, shooting the autocannon provides just enough damage to see what the light version of this armor with this passive provides. Without fortified, I will die from this shot wearing light armor or medium armor while standing or crouching. While prone, I sustain very little damage. For the Stay Puff Marshmallow armor, I die while standing but don't die when crouched. 
barely. Transitioning from standing to crouching to prone decreases the amount of damage you will receive from explosions. If you have full health and are running an armor that provides fortified, you are much less likely to sustain a fatal blow from an explosion. I spent a lot of time blowing myself up. This passive works, but I can't figure out the circumstances for all the different types of explosions. On one hand, I can take a couple of proximity blasts from an automaton cannon wearing the light fortified armor and then die from the impact. On the other hand, I can take a rocket to the face wearing the fortified commando, which has extra padding, while standing and didn't die, but died while standing firing an autocannon into a wall. I've thrown grenades and walked near them at varying distances, I can only come to one conclusion. I'm either going to be unaware of an explosion going off near me, like in the case of a cannon shot, or I'm going to be aware of an explosion coming my way and I move. I'm not going to look at the distance between me and a grenade and think, oh, I'll be fine at this range. I'm gonna dive away. Medkit increases initial inventory and holding capacity of stims by plus two, increases stim effect duration by 2.0 seconds. Without the Hellpod Space Optimization Booster, you will dive in with four of six stims. With it, you will drop in maxed out at six. The increased stim effect duration of two seconds, which I believe is double the time you'd typically have a stim running, is great for two reasons. One, sometimes you pop a stim, are engaged in combat, and are taking a lot of hits. This gives you a bit of a buffer to come out of that fight with full health. And two, stims recharge your stamina. This will allow you to sprint for a much longer period of time. Taking a little bit of damage by walking off a ledge or getting hit by an enemy will provide you with the freedom to stim whenever you're out of stamina giving you a lot more range than you would normally have. This isn't a bad idea anyway, but when you have six stims at your disposal, it's kind of a no-brainer, at least for me. I do wish the game would allow you to stim when at full health, but it doesn't. This armor is what I'll typically wear when I'm running a flamethrower. It isn't uncommon to set yourself on fire and using a stim will let you shrug it off and continue your pyromania. Scout. Markers placed on the map will generate radar scans every 2.0 seconds. Reduces range at which enemies can detect their wearer by 30%. A player's radar will scan about every one second. You can see that the radar scan for my map marker performs a scan at about half the rate of my personal radar. Your map marker will inherit any radar boosting capabilities you have, so nuclear radar and UAV recon booster. Straightforward enough but let's talk about the map for a moment. There is a grid overlay on the map. The more pronounced lines are 65 meters by 65 meters square. They are broken up into a five by five subgrid. Each subgrid is 13 meters by 13 meters. I diagonally bisected the square and checked the hypotenuse. If calculating distance diagonally from corner to corner at 45 degrees, the distance is 18.38 meters for a small square and 91.92 meters for a big square. Why is this important? Well, if you know how far your detection range is based on what you're wearing, you can give it a glance to better plan your route. I can tell you right now that the values I've come to do not always reflect a 30% reduced detection range. 30% is the highest reduction I see within the data, but that is standing during the day directly in front of an enemy. The lowest reduction I've seen is around 20%, and that's for being prone at night directly in front of an enemy. The scout passive does reduce your overall detection signature, but it isn't an across-the-board 30% reduction, at least in my testing against automatons on Tier 3, with no weather effects using the same map seed in both day and night conditions. I'm listing these values in descending order since this is the manner in which you approach a target. You should know that the values shown on the map and what you see in ADS are the same. The distance your camera is away from your head will add to this value. The enemy cares not for where your camera is, just something to be aware of. It should be noted that the values I have listed here are from my third person perspective, so they are slightly higher than they technically are by one to three meters. That being said, you're likely attempting to navigate around a ping target in third person perspective, but for using the map to determine if you'll trigger something, the actual values will be one to three meters less than what I'm showing. I studied quite a few videos before testing the scout passive. Umbrin has a video that is a pretty good primer on stealth mechanics and goes into more detail on audio signature. 
I am uncertain if he tested the scout passive differences to another passive, or if he just converted values up or down by 30%. One of Erevin's videos gave me the idea to test at night, but provided little to no evidence that diving at night reduces detection range. I have provided the proof, it is true. Erevin has another video talking about terminids and how weather effects can reduce detection range and that it can stack with the nighttime effect. I tested Erevin's baseline against terminids, and it does provide very similar values to those I'm seeing at nighttime against the automatons. There was some light rain during my mission, and I don't know if this was skewing the results, but as of now, automatons and terminids may very well have different detection ranges. I was under the impression they were the same. I'll leave links to these videos in the description. There is more to test here, but for a video that isn't specifically about this, we're just gonna have to move on. Servo Assisted. Increases throwing range by 30%. Provides plus 50% limb health. When wearing armor that has servo assisted, the furthest I was able to throw from an elevated position was 74 meters. Without servo assisted, the furthest I could throw from roughly the same position with the same map seed was 55 meters. This is a 34 to 35% increase. I am in an elevated position and there is also the possibility for the stratagems to bounce and or roll when they land. For the 50% limb health, I went over this in my boosters video. This will increase the number of hits you can sustain before being injured when using a P19 redeemer against limbs. This also allows you to fall off ledges and not sustain injuries to your leg. I did a little bit of combat testing with this armor and compared it against the orange engineer armor. For the number of hits taken, this medium servo assisted armor fared pretty much the same. For number of injuries sustained, it received four, while the orange engineer received six. There is one torso injury accounted for in each of these armors. Otherwise, it's three and five respectively. This is a very small sample size, but is reflective of what the passive states that it provides. Testing products. I have created a Google Sheet showing my breakdown of the data. I will provide its link in the description. I am not the greatest at math and statistics, so any help any of you can provide on my data breakdown would be much appreciated. Please provide your feedback in the comments section of this video. I have also created a second video to accompany this one with the vast majority of my testing cuts in it. It is unlisted, but you'll find a link to it in the description. Having more minds sifting through this could help provide clarity to the results, provide insight into refining testing methodology, or provide checks on my data for accuracy. For some of the calculations in the spreadsheet, I'm using percentage of change. Here is how I represent this formula on screen, and here are a couple of examples of its implementation in the Google Sheet. Speed and Stamina There are a few things I wanted to know about the armor types. How many hits can we take wearing any of the armor types? How fast do we move? How far can we travel at speed? How much stamina does each have? And what do the values we see in the armor rating, speed, and stamina regen stats mean? I'm assuming total stamina is a stat that exists, but we are unable to see it. I cannot make any sense of stamina regen as it applies to my collected data. I'm assuming it's a percentage like 50%, 100%, 125%. What it is a percentage of, I do not know. I cannot derive stamina from the data I've collected. Medium armor is the most prevalent in the game. The steeled veterans and cutting edge war bonds for armor contain four medium armors, one heavy armor, and one light armor. In the entirety of the game, currently, there are 19 medium armors, nine light armors, and eight heavy armors. So it made sense to use medium armor as a baseline for something I can drive. Comparisons of stamina from medium armor to light and heavy armors as a percentage. I used Alt F4 for preserving the same map seed in all of my tests. This tip was provided by many helpful individuals in the comment section of my boosters video. I certainly appreciate it as it's been invaluable in conducting this study. For speed testing, I did my best to place my right foot on this rock. I'd scope in with the 200 meter magnification setting on my Liberator to the corner of this concrete barrier, ensuring it read 74 meters, released ADS, and verified the distance measured 76 meters. I'm sure there is some error in my exact placement within the map, but this is about as precise a method as I could conjure up. I sprinted to the barrier and hopped over it. The time frame I'm measuring is from the moment my stamina bar begins to show up to the point where my right foot is on top of the barrier for the vault. 
Since this includes a partial vault, the speed in meters per second is likely slightly faster than the values I've derived. I feel like my starting point is fairly repeatable, but I needed some sort of endpoint that was clearly defined, thus the vault. That being said, since each test is conducted with the same parameters, it will do well enough for what we want to know. Just be aware that as each value of speed increases at the same rate, e.g. the vault, but the difference in speed among the armors doesn't increase, this skews the percentage of difference toward higher similarity. All right, if we know how far we're sprinting and how long it takes, we can derive sprint speed in meters per second. The speed variation is about half a meter per second from light to medium and is roughly the same from medium to heavy. I do not know how the values for the speed stat from armor line up with this. If you can provide any insight into this or have some ideas about it, please share them in the comments. For stamina testing, I conducted it in the same manner I did when I tested the stamina enhancement booster in my previous video. The time begins as soon as the stamina bar reveals itself and ends when there is no more white present in the bar. If we know the speed in meters per second and how long we can sprint in seconds before hitting the stamina recovery phase, we can derive how far we can travel in meters while sprinting. So we've taken the timings of traveling a known distance and of sprinting until exhaustion and we've converted them into speed in meters per second and sprint range in meters. Why does this matter? The sprint speed is just interesting, but sprint range can be helpful in knowing before you commit to how far you're gonna have to be able to sprint before tiring out. For instance, the baseline for light armor, you can travel 10 to 14 grids, remember the map? Depending on if you're traveling at 45 degrees, in the case of 10 grids, or straight north, east, south, or west in the case of 14 grids, and remember that those big grids are comprised of five grids north and south and five grids east and west. So if you see that you need to sprint two of those larger grids and you're wearing light armor, you'll make it there before exhaustion no matter what. Time to compare the stamina differences among the armor types. Remember, medium armor is what we're comparing against. It should be noted that there are no environmental factors at play here. This tells us the difference in total stamina I've found that light armor has 29% more stamina than medium armor, and that heavy armor has 31% less stamina than medium armor. Unfortunately, the differences among them is the closest I can get to determining stamina values. Some other notable statistics concerning the differences among the armors are sprint range and the value stamina regen provides each respective armor. Sprint range is kind of a no-brainer just looking at the testing results. Light armor has 39% more sprint range than medium armor, and heavy armor has 37% less sprint range than medium armor. The sprint range I'm showing here was calculated without the stamina enhancement booster. I calculated it for both with and without this booster across the armor types. You can find the different calculations in the Google Sheet I've provided. The stamina regen stat provided by Arrowhead is not very useful to me. I determined a stamina economy value for each armor type by dividing the stamina regen time by sprint range. Since these values are determined using the results from the same data collection standard, they are comparable. The higher the number, the more valuable the stamina regen. Basically, this is determining a ratio between stamina regen time and sprint range, like fuel economy or miles per gallon on a vehicle. Yes, I'm an American, we're talking miles per gallon here. The differences across all armor types with the stamina enhancement booster is an additional 30% sprint time and a 23% reduction in stamina recovery time. The same results from my review of this booster in my previous video. The Stamina Enhancement Booster increases the stamina economy across the armors between 68 and 69%, a massive increase. One last point to make before moving on is there is a fourth sheet in the Google Sheet for the B27 Fortified Commando. This was tested using a different methodology and I was looking at nine different armors at the time. All of this data was collected, but I wasn't super keen on the methodology I employed for testing, so I scrapped it. I left this sheet in there to talk about maximum combat efficiency. Combat. The first time I heard about armor rating doing nothing was from one of Wolf Rain's videos. There have been some follow-up videos on it. I'll leave a link to the original and the latest videos on the armor rating testing in my description. For Wolfrain's latest video, as of writing this, she showcases the maximum number of hits you can take to the body before expiring with and without the Vitality Enhancement Booster. 
I have come to the exact same conclusion. However, as you can see in my spreadsheet, the values for maximum number of hits taken isn't much of a guarantee. It's a bit all over the place. The gray bars can give you a general understanding of how they compare when you cycle between the light, medium, and heavy armor. Additionally, on the right side, you can see a breakdown of rates of standard body shots, criticals to the body, headshots, and injuries. There are some that are undetermined in there, but these are all killing blows. There was not enough health left to determine if it was a critical or a standard body shot. There is a key at the top to explain classification. A critical, to me, is a body shot that does more than a standard body shot. I don't know why they occur. I did my best to identify them. I probably didn't catch all of them. If you know anything about this, drop it in the comments. I did my best to determine if something was a critical or a standard body shot. I don't actually know if these are quote unquote critical, but I do know that there are attacks to the body that do more damage. I'm uncertain if this is due to injury, hitting the same spot over and over, or what. It's very difficult to tell, and I looked at all these attacks for quite a long period of time. In total, not counting the fortified commando armor or my maximum headshot tests, I studied 133 attacks across three armors. With those added in, this was a review of 228 attacks across four armors. It took a while, but this is still a very small sample, and the stat rollup for rates of crits, headshots, and injuries should be taken with a grain of salt. What I do know is that for strikes to your body, so not headshots, the Vitality Enhancement Booster results in more or less one extra hit than you would normally take for 50 to 100 armor rating. This also applies to your head, thus increasing the number of headshots you can receive before expiring by one, which doesn't sound like much, but that is a 50% increase. For 150 to 200 armor rating, it's two extra shots to the body. The B24 Enforcer, a medium armor with fortitude, has an armor rating of 129, which falls between 100 and 150. I'm uncertain how the Vitality Enhancement Booster affects the maximum number of body shots on this armor. Helmets have an armor rating of 100. If we look at the maximum number of body shots with 100 armor without the Vitality Enhancement Booster, we're sitting at 6. For 50 armor, it's 5. The maximum number of headshots you can take is 2. I have some theories on what is happening here. One, either headshots are dealing triple damage. Two, they are hard-coded to do half of your maximum base health and damage. Or three, the armor rating isn't working and there is a major fall off in damage mitigation between zero and 50 armor. I am certainly not the first individual to point out the headshot mechanic and I probably will not be the last. Very early on in the game, it was discovered that there were a couple of helmets that provided stat shifts. Odo has a video exploring this a bit. I'll leave a timestamped link in the description. One second after the timestamp is when the strike occurs. I cannot be certain that this was a headshot. It seems like it is, so it appears that adding armor value here greatly reduces headshot damage. It's difficult to tell. I think that headshots as a mechanic against players is something that is difficult to play around. I'd like to circle back to one thing we've covered, but I didn't show you everything at the time. The Tesla Tower, when running electrical conduit, can headshot you, doing massive damage. If you aren't running Vitality Enhancement Booster, this can happen twice, and then you're dead. The fact that I can be domed with a rocket, dropping my health to such a low amount in the beefiest, slowest armor in the game is probably why players are running around with the shield pack frequently and lighter medium armor. Headshots can happen in an instant and in quick succession. They don't feel good. I do know that if headshots were removed from the game, it would give the different armor types more purpose. I am no game designer. I just know what feels bad. Being headshot out of nowhere feels bad. I don't know what's going on with headshots and armor rating. I also don't know what the landscape would be if certain helmets could reduce headshot damage. They would be objectively the best, and most people would run them. This would create a scenario of what is meta versus what is cool. Armor types are more clearly defined than they were at launch. Fixing helmets and or headshots is going to be complicated from a perspective of what is fun and enjoyable versus what is challenging and punishing. Time will tell, I guess. If I were to recommend to someone the best setup for the highest survivability, this is it. Take Democracy Protects and a Shield Pack. I was able to take 23 shots from this scavenger before expiring. The fact that this is medium armor means that you don't give up too much on the mobility side of the game. This is far from consistent, but it has saved my life where I most definitely should have died. Other times, I had my fingers crossed and just didn't make it. 
Knowing what I know about the impact headshots have on play, I put even more emphasis on the Vitality Enhancement Booster in my loadout when we're in a four-man. This does increase your health just enough to survive two headshots, which may be the difference between a stim and a reinforcement. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to explore armor with me. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like. And if you want to see more content like this, please subscribe. Either or both of these would help me out a lot. And with that, I'm out.